This talk was given by archivist Jenny Duffy at National Records of Scotland in General Register House, Edinburgh, on 9th November 2017. The event was part of a series of free talks organised alongside our free exhibition, Rogues Gallery, Faces of Crime, 1870 to 1917, which is open until 1st of December. You can find the programme of talks at our website, nrscotland.gov.uk. Just click on Events, Talks and Visits. Jenny told us about her work on 200 years of police records dating as far back as 1805, which she undertook for Edinburgh City Archives. As part of this recording, we've included the photographs and documents that Jenny describes, and unless otherwise stated, these documents are held by Edinburgh City Archives. Jenny was introduced by Jocelyn Grant, an outreach archivist at National Records of Scotland. Thanks, Jocelyn. Um, I'll just put that away. So, um, yeah, good morning. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm delighted to see so many of you um, here. Um, I really hope you enjoy the talk this morning. I've got some great things to show you, um, most of which have never been seen before. So just to give you some background to the Rogues and Old Weekly project, um, Edinburgh City Archives received a grant in 2016 to catalogue their police records. These had been deposited over a period of 20 years um, from various different sources. Um, some came from the High Street Police, High Street Information Centre. Um, there was a, a museum in Leith Police Station. Some records came from there. Some were individual donors. And then various station clearouts over the years, and most recently from Police Scotland itself. Um, so when I started last September, um, I had 12 months to catalogue um, the records. There was approximately 150 unopened boxes um, of records um, spanning 200 years of, of police history in Edinburgh and the Lothians. So there's a lot of material, all jumbled up. Um, the oldest item we have is a complaints book from 1805. Um, and they related to nine different police forces, um, all of which over the years amalgamated to become Lothian and Borders Police in 1975. So it's a wonderful collection. It's given me a real appreciation of what must be a profession that experiences extreme highs and extreme lows. Um, there's some real harrowing tales in there, um, but they sit alongside records relating to royal visits, charity events, Hogmanay, Commonwealth Games. So um, real, real extremes. So this morning I'm going to talk about some of the highlights. Um, it was really difficult to choose what to show you this morning because there's so much. Um, just before we start, some of the records that didn't make the cut, um, we had um, 19th century architectural plans of police stations, some of which are beautifully um, hand-painted. Um, they're just really too large for me to photograph and, and show you today, so, so unfortunately they're not, they're not going to be on display. Um, records relating to the first road bridge opening in 1964, these were recently displayed on the Edinburgh City Archives Facebook page, so I missed them off. Um, and mugshots of the Wallyford Teddy Boys who <laughs> terrorised East Lothian in the 1950s. And I left them out just in case any of you are here today <laughs> to take the risk. First half of my talk, I'm going to introduce you to some distinct record sets. Um, and then the second half of my talk, I'm going to concentrate on some of the stories um, of the individuals who appear in the criminal photograph albums, which are the focus of the exhibition. Um, downstairs. So first up, a few photographs. There's a large number of photographs in the collection showing personnel, police vehicles and equipment, police stations and of course criminal investigations. First one, this is one of the oldest photographs, oh, one of the oldest photographs that we have. This is a detachment of Edinburgh City Police that attended the funeral of Queen Victoria in February 1901. There's no names on the photograph, unfortunately, but if I can work this. This chap here in the middle, in all his finery, is Roderick Ross, and he was the Chief Constable of Edinburgh City Police from 1900 to 1935. The Scotsman also records that Inspector Forbes and Sergeant Watt attended, so these will be the two gentlemen on either side, sitting in the front here. Um, so they travelled down to London by train on the Friday afternoon, the funeral was on the Saturday, and they followed immediately after the royal carriages. The Edinburgh Evening News writes that 
the men presented a fine appearance and their magnificent physique caused general admiration. <laughs> One of the things I particularly like about this photo is, where is my pointer, um, that they've gone to the trouble of bringing out this luxurious animal skin rug <laughs> to sit on and have their photo taken. Um, right, the next photograph. Um, this is Edinburgh City Police plain clothes staff, taken in 1914. Um, all but a few of them are sporting moustaches, and they've all got hats on. Um, I, I haven't been able to work out where this photograph was taken. Um, the headquarters of Edinburgh City Police at this time were in Parliament Square. I think, John, that's correct. Um, so possibly along one of the walls of St Giles. I don't know, it looks like a church behind them. I don't know. Um, but that's the plain clothes staff. Now, if we move on to a slightly later photograph of the Criminal Investigation Department, this is taken in 1922. They've lost their hats. <laughs> <laughs> but this is interesting because we've got the two first female officers um, employed by, by Edinburgh City Police. Um, on this side, we have Hebe Kempthorne, who was appointed in 1920. And the other side, Alice Duncan, who pointed in 1921. It was really considered that female officers would be more suited to dealing, assisting with, with victims of, of crime, in particular women and children. The next photograph I have to show you is a crime scene. <laughs> this is it here. This shows, um, it shows the interior of James Steele's workshop. So James Steele, along with his partner Robert Ramsey, were convicted um, under the Coinage Offences Act in November 1930 and sentenced to three years in prison. They lived in a flat in Dalry. Um, this is their workshop, which was located at Muriston Crescent Lane, also Dalry, Gorgie area. Um, it's no longer there. I've been to check. <laughs> it's now <laughs> modern flats. Um, but the pair were prolific counterfeiters. Um, coins made from the dyes found in this workshop have been, had been identified by the Royal Mint as early as 1923, so they had probably been at it for a good seven years before they were um, discovered. Um, it was a postmistress on Elm Row that first thought something was amiss. She noticed that on the same day every week, um, a group of young lads were coming in, um, buying postal orders with the same denom denomination of coins and it always included two half crowns dated 1920. So she thought this was quite suspicious. And she went to two different banks who um, reassured her that the coins were genuine. So she still didn't give up and she felt, well, if the coins are genuine, there's something definitely suspicious about the boys. How are they coming into con you know, possession of, of, of this money and, and what are they up to? So she went to Edinburgh City Police and they staked out the post office in Elm Row, followed one of the boys and saw him giving the postal order to James Steele um, in, in, in Union Street. And he was taken to Gayfield Square Police Station where he was found to be in possession of counterfeit coins. Flat was searched and eventually the workshop was discovered. Um, the Chief Assayer's report in 1930 states that the offence is regarded as the most serious case of counterfeiting silver coinage which has hitherto been recorded. Um, Jessie Tennant, the postmistress, she was awarded £50 from the Treasury for her efforts. Um, the trial records are, are held here in the National Records and uh, I have had a quick look and there's quite a lot of correspondence between the police and James Steele's agent discussing the equipment. Um, it was obviously it was, it was confiscated by the police but James Steele's agent um, said well it's actually it's my client's property and, and we want it back. I don't know how much of it was returned to James Steele um, but he was convicted again in 1960 of the same <laughs> crime. Um, he was 45 in, 19, in 1930, so he was still going strong uh, in his 70s. Mm -hmm. All right, the next set of records. Uh, general orders. So these were instructions um, issued by the chief constable to the men of the force. And they'd be, so each station would keep a general order book um, general orders would be written down into the book and read out to the day force and then again to the night force when they came on duty. 
Um, it, it's, a, it's a huge collection. They were really quite prolific. Um, sometimes handwritten letters being sent out every other day. Um, and they cover anything and everything from what the police are wearing and when they should start wearing it to, <coughs> um, to what the people of Edinburgh um, are up to and what they're concerned with. Um, I used these in a school workshop recently because they also are really good at illustrating that the police, um, which is something that Dr McGowan, who's here today, is talking on Monday, is always at pains um, to tell me throughout the project that um, the police are not just concerned with crime. They're also um, taking on tasks that, um, especially at this time, that were the responsibility of, or are now the responsibility of council departments and, and, and charities, things like clothing destitute children, uh, looking after lost animals, inspecting property, and conveying the injured to, to hospital and also the dead to the morgue. Um, so there are a wealth of information. I've picked just a few examples to read out to you today. Okay. So here, these three all relate to police uniforms. Um, the, there's many more discussing uniform uh, and their equipment, but the, these ones, so the great coats, 1878, um, the force will begin to wear their new great coats tomorrow. Sergeants must see that they are all buttoned on the same side. The buttoning should be reversed once a month. I think that's to stop wear and tear on their, on their coats. The gloves, chief of police has much pleasure in distributing to the force a pair of warm knitted gloves for each man. The white ones to be worn by the day force, the black ones by the night force. The chief constable directs that leggings be worn from now until 1st of March. So their uniform was really quite, quite heavily regulated and they all had to wear the same thing at the same time. Um, they were also issued with sponges to wipe off graffiti and they were instructed when it was appropriate to light their lamps or use their truncheons. I've got a general order here to read out to you which I've not transcri tra transcribed so bear with me but it's conduct of the police was, um, was something that was, that was very important and this is from 1885. <coughs> The Chief Constable observes with regret that members of the force disregard the rules and regulations as to wearing of their gloves when on duty. These must be worn at all times when on duty, especially in the daytime, and when not actually engaged and putting their hands on anything or in the act of apprehending parties. They must on no account be carried in the belts. It has also come to his knowledge that many of the force are in the habit of smoking when on duty in uniform and even in public places. He does not wish to deprive them of their pipe, but he knows that they can find a way of getting it out of the public gaze, and the habit must be at once discontinued. The vulgar and unbecoming habit of thrusting their hands into their trouser pockets must also be <laughs> discontinued. Um, right, the next two relate to traffic, um, the increasing number of vehicles. Um, yeah, so the increasing number of vehicles on the road in Edinburgh is, is a subject of, of, of many general orders. This is just two of them. Um, this one from 1878. Um, Chief of Police has been informed that nearly every morning the tramway car leaving Leith at 5.31 is terribly overcrowded and arrangements must be made to have this put a stop to. There's also many general orders instructing the police to um, reprimand boys hanging off the back of, of tram cars and hitching a ride. Um, the one here from 1892, bicycles ridden furiously, there is far too much fast riding cycles in the busy parts of the city, especially in Princes Street, where the new wooden pavement has been put down. I'm entirely sure where that, where that was. Um, right, my final three examples are dealing with various different types of antisocial behaviour, which Edinburgh people were concerned with, there we go. Um, so the first one here, sliding on foot pavements. This was a real problem uh, if, if you're reading the general orders. Um, during the frosty weather, slides are being made in many streets. The force must use every exertion to prevent this practice. Constables should also keep in mind that where they find orange peel on the footpath, they should kick it off and many accidents can be prevented. There's a real sort of health and safety um, side to, 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 to what the police are doing at this time. The one in the middle here is probably one of my favourites. Um, uh, playing cat or tip cat. This was a kind of craze among the young children in Edinburgh. It's a form of cricket, I think, which is played with a small wooden, um, small piece of wood known as the cat. Um, so this game has become so common as to be a serious annoyance on the streets. Most of the players are very young boys who are quite reckless as to whether or not they knock the cat into someone's face. Constables should take the piece of wood and destroy it. 
And the last one here at the far side, um, flower pots on windowsills. Attention is called to the practice of placing flower pots outside windows without any proper guard to prevent them being blown down. Constables must see that persons offending in this manner should be warned. Um, and that's 1883. And actually, interestingly, um, the, the complaints book from 1805, which is one of the earliest records we have, that there's a lot of instances of, of, of this exact complaint, people having flower pots on their windowsills. So there are, of course, a lot of records relating to crime. Um, many of the crimes, they're not dissimilar to what we see today. There's a lot of fighting, assaults, breaches of the peace. Um, I've picked a few <coughs> examples from our charge and, and complaint books um, that are perhaps a wee bit more unusual, things that we wouldn't find today. First one here, uh, James Mitchell, 26. Again, it's this furious driving. Um, road surveyor, furious driving by recklessly and furiously driving a horse yoked to a gig through several streets between the hours of four and five on the 30th of April 1872. He was remitted to the Borough Court in Bathgate for, for sentencing. Patrick Masterton, 38, a hawker, theft of six turnips from a field at a roadside between the hours of seven and eight on the 19th of November. Um, he was found in possession of the turnips. Um, which belonged to James Walker, a uh, farmer in Whitburn. Um, and he was cited to appear in court um, a day or two later, but managed to abscond in the meantime. I don't know if he had the turnips <laughs> with him or not. Um, next, John Fraser, yep, 28, a rope spinner or a vagrant, no fixed abode. Theft of a small beef pie from an eating house uh, or coffee house in 1882. You've got seven days imprisonment for that. Um, it's obviously hungry, uh, a hungry chap. Um, there are some children in the charge books. The next two surely must be two of the youngest. We've got Edward Duncan, seven, and James Patterson, five years only. Um, they were charged with malicious mischief by throwing stones and breaking 16 panes of glass in windows of a stable, a milk house, and a boffy. Um, between the 2nd and 3rd of April, 1872. So there were no proceedings. <laughs> they didn't have any punishment other than probably a, a, a telling off. But it's still interesting that it's been recorded uh, in the book. Teenagers this time, 18, 16, 15 years old, um, they were charged with the contravention of Borough Police Act by playing a game of football on the high street in the Lithgow near to the grocer's shop um, at 5pm on the 20th of June, 1902. Um, so they were given the choice. They could pay a fine of two shillings or two days in prison. So they all paid the fine. Um, oh, and lastly, this is quite a sad tale of some criminal damage. Um, John Hunter, a miner in Whitburn, reported that his beehive and bees had been stolen from his garden uh, in 1872. The hive was found in a barn some distance from the garden. Bees drowned and the combs destroyed. No trace was found of the perpetrator um, of, of, um, of that crime. Okay, so the final set of records that I'm going to talk about uh, before moving on to the photograph albums. A bundle of papers, um, which not only relate to a Victorian mystery, but they pose a bit of a puzzle in, in their own right. So they relate to an incident that took place up in Aberdeenshire. The Earl of Crawford had died while he was over in Italy and his body was returned to Danech to be buried in the family vault. Um, in late 1881, it was discovered that the body had been snatched from the vault and taken to places unknown. So it's, it's unclear why the papers are amongst the Lothian and Borders Police archive. Um, a reference is, main, is made to them in uh, Forthright, which was the staff magazine of Lothian and Borders Police, um, where they mentioned they have recently come into possession of these records. Um, it's possible that they were donated by a member of the Cran family. Inspector George Cran was one of the policemen in charge of the, the investigation. And <coughs> the papers do include some Cran family accounts. So they're, they're probably from, from the family. Um, there was a Cran who served in Edinburgh City Police in the 1920s. It's possible that that could be the connection why they ended up in, in Edinburgh. So the story begins 
It's, it's got everything, actually. It's got anonymous letters, spiritualists, body snatching. Um, it begins with an anonymous letter I sent to the family solicitor, Mr Yates. Um, this is a contemporary photograph of it that, that we have within the records as it was, it was um, widely circulated at the time. So it reads, Sir, the remains of the late Earl of Crawford are not beneath the chapel at Denecht, as you believe, but were removed since last spring, and the smell of decaying flowers ascending from the vault since that time will, on investigation, be found to proceed from another cause than flowers. It was signed simply Nabob. Um, so a couple of months previously, it had been noted by workers on the estate that there, there was a funny smell <laughs> coming from the vault. Um, they thought it was rotting flowers or something to do with the Italian embalmers, um, and it wasn't investigated any further. Mr Yates, uh, he thought that the, this letter was a hoax and he did nothing, nothing more about it either. It was only in the September of 1881 when the vault was discovered to be visibly tampered with that the police were called in and the Bob's letter was brought to light. Um, so within the papers are Inspector Cran's report, um, this is from December 1881, um, and he describes going into the vault for the first time. Um, received notice of the burying vault at Denecht having been broken open, and by orders of the Chief Constable, I left Aberdeen a little past noon. Reached Denecht about 2pm and ordered the workmen to turn over the stone, and I descended into the vault. On being supplied with a light, I could see at a glance that the body was removed. So a UK-wide investigation then ensues. Um, the Bob's letter is circulated and an amateur detective publishes it in a, in a, in a newspaper. Um, the Aberdeenshire police are then flooded with letters um, with helpful suggestions and uh, finger pointing at various local individuals. Two of them, um, these are some of the letters from the collection. So one letter, this one on the left-hand side, um, which originates uh, from Preston, I think, or the middle one originates from Preston, the one on the left here suggests that the body was in fact never returned to Scotland. And he writes, regarding the sad affair at Denecht, it might be as well to make inquiry at the late Lordship's servant who brought the body home, if ever he saw the body in any of the coffins, there were three coffins, one inside the other, for it is thought by some that it is probable that the body has never come to Denecht. The middle letter here, signed Chick, I think, um, says, from information received, I am led to believe that the late Earl of Crawford's body, which was removed from the vault in May last, was brought back in November and reinterred in the bushes exactly 15 yards south of the vault. I'm given to understand that six persons were engaged in removing the body and they were all Americans. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was also suggested that perhaps a spiritualist could, could help find the Earl's remains. Um, Inspector Crandy dismisses this outright and this is his letter to Detective Swanston, um, who was also involved in the investigation. And he writes, I have thought out the theory that has been suggested to you, and the only spirits I am partial to are walkers. <laughs> he goes on to say in the same letter, I am so anxious that the body be restored. I could almost leave the scoundrels to their guilty conscience, but we may accomplish both and nothing would give me more pleasure. Um, now the next slide I've got just shows you a couple of quite interesting scribblings that are amongst the papers and I think this is them kind of jotting down ideas for possible um, investigative uh, procedures. First one at the top, if a body be hidden underground would a bloodhound getting sent from the sawdust be of any use and they did in fact use bloodhounds to try and find the remains. Um, casts of footprints, um, they wanted to get casts perhaps of the um, footprints they found which didn't correspond to any of the servants' feet. So they do, there's a lot of people taking them for questioning. They eventually arrest a local rat catcher by the name of Charles Souter for the crime. Um, he admits to being the mysterious Nabob and he says that he has written the letters. Um, but he consistently denies any involvement in the actual crime itself. Um, he claims to have been poaching in the woods uh, on the estate and came across um, two, two men burying the Earl's remains. Um, and they threatened him, threatened his life if he breathed a word to, of what he had seen. Um, so this is, again, from the papers. I think it's a contemporary transcript, possibly, of a letter written by Charles Souter um, during his trial. Um, he's, he's awaiting sentence. And he writes, Dear Kate, I now take the opportunity of letting you know that I am well. 
and I hope you're doing the same for there may be many happy days in store for us yet and whatever people think you at least know that I am innocent. He was found guilty um, and he was sentenced to five years in prison. They did on his evidence find the remains of the Earl um, which I think were taken down to Wigan uh, to be reburied down there. Um. Right so now I'm going to move on to the criminal photograph albums which are the focus of, of the exhibition downstairs and if you haven't had a chance to see it please do go and have a look um, before you go today if you if you have time. There are three um, criminal conviction uh, photograph albums, one from each of the Lothian constabularies, West Lothian, East Lothian and Middle Lothian. And they, cover, uh, they both cover late 19th uh, to early 20th centuries. And there are wonderful records of, of Victorian and Edwardian offenders. We don't know much about the albums. We don't know if they are part of a larger series or if they, if they were one-offs. Um, they include both photographs of, of offenders taken at the time of their arrest they also include photographs of, of offenders on their release from prison. Um, if when they were released from prison, they intimated that they, they were going to go to Blinlithgow, for example, then their photograph would be sent to the West Lothian Constabulary and they could keep it in their album. So um, it's, it, it's kind of early database, really, of, of known, uh, known criminals. They're also often accompanied by physical descriptions uh, recording distinguishing marks or, or tattoos. Um, their, their occupation. So they're, they're a real, real uh, fund of information. Um, the exhibition shows some more high profile criminals uh, from, who were charged at the High Court for, court for serious crime. Um, but the volumes also include a large number of petty criminals, uh, vagrants, small time crooks um, who are processed by the police and or the sheriff court. So I've picked a couple of them to show you today. First up, a chap called James Easton. He is a slater from Bathgate, and he was convicted in 1882 of stealing from his father, who's described as a letter carrier, and also his brother, Robert. Um, he's 20 years of age in this photo. This is taken on his release from Perth prison, um, and he said his intended residence was, was to, he was gonna go back to Bathgate. Um, he stole a number of articles, including two silver watches, some money, a suit of clothes and a top coat, all of which he pawned. He was arrested in Manchester and conveyed to the Lithgow Sheriff Court for trial, where he was sentenced to nine months. He defended his actions by saying he needed the money to find work. Um, he'd stolen from his family before, however, and in his signed declaration amongst his trial papers, he writes, I was punished for something of this kind before, and my brother Robert was constantly casting it up to me and I got no peace at home. Um, yeah, so he got nine months. And this is, you can see here how they often record um, physical deformities or peculiarities. Um, so he's a cut to his left temple. Right, the next two individuals here, interesting uh, pair. Um, they were charged together also in 1882 um, with theft by housebreaking at a farm in Humby. So one of the things that is always kind of surprised, you know, never ceases to amaze me when, when I'm go reading about these, these stories um, is the sheer number of people that appear just to be wandering around the country and just constantly on the move. Um, and these two, are, they're, they're doing just that. Um, so the chap on the left, mark number one, is Michael Quinn. And he states in his declaration, uh, I'm 23 years of age, a lithographic printer and have no fixed abode. I'm a native of Ireland. I had white swelling in my knee and have not worked since then. My leg was amputated in October, two years past. Since then, I have been tramping about the country. I met Charles Malone in a small town in the borders and we have both walked through this neighborhood supporting ourselves, singing or asking charity. So his partner in crime is Charles Malone and he is 18 years of age, a farm labourer, a native of America. I was brought to this country when I was a year old and have since resided at Annick. I left Annick three weeks ago and fell in with Michael Quinn at Glanton. We came by Coldstream and Greenlaw to Edinburgh. We came to Kirkliston on Saturday last. So they're just constantly uh, moving around. They broke into a farmhouse in Humby and stole a random assortment of, of household goods, really, including two mugs, a curtain cord, a bed cover, two towels, a paraffin lamp, 
tablecloth, a cloth brush, a toilet cover and a wooden matchbox. Um, they both declared that there were m much more valuable items in the house which they did not take. Um, so, it, it, I mean, it does appear that they've taken things really to, to make their life on the road just that little bit more bearable. Um, it seems to be what, what they were up to. Um, right, the next one, really quite a tragic figure. Um, this is Agnes Malloy or Brown. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a sad story. She's, she is, um, by all accounts, an alcoholic. Um, it's quite a familiar story. Um, she has, in her lifetime, or up, up to this point, she's 32 in this photograph, she's amassed in excess of 90 convictions for theft and breach of the peace. Um, so here she's, she's um, sentenced to four months for theft and previous conviction. Um, in her signed declaration within her trial work, as she writes, I gave my little boy a sovereign, but I don't recollect what he was to do with it, as I had got a good deal of whiskey after I took the money. Um, I've I looked in a wee bit to, to Agnes's life, and she actually lives to the age of 67, which I feel, given her circumstances, is, is, is quite an achievement. Um, she was still of no fixed abode when she died. Um, she was found... Um, somewhat fittingly, at uh, the distillery in Bournemouth in 1915. <laughs> Her cause of death was heart failure. Um, okay, here's one next. This is one of my favourites. Um, this is a man called Benjamin Gray. Um, now, I know you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, but I'm not sure you'll be entirely surprised to learn that Mr Gray here, he's a con man, he's a fraudster. <laughs> Um, and he had a number of convictions um, uh, for theft committed uh, throughout the country. Um, so back in 1903, he was tried at Leith Police Court. Um, he was charged with pretending to a grocer on Bonington Road that he was the chief steward on the SS Mona from Aberdeen. He ordered groceries to the sum of £7 to be sent to the ship and asked for a loan of 21 shillings, which he promised to pay the following day. Um, he was given 14 days imprisonment for that. Um, he's also, he's got various convictions for theft, stealing a suit of clothes and underwear from a traveller on East Adam Street in 1905, uh, for which he got 40 days. The same year, he sent to jail for 60 days for stealing five views from a pawn shop. I guess they're photographs or, or images of, of some sort. Um, in 1911, he gets six months imprisonment for stealing a bicycle from a shop in Duke Street by means of a story that he'd been sent by a gentleman in Leith to, to pick it up. And in 1912, he's given a year's uh, sentence for inducing again another grocer, this time in Abbey Hill, to supply him with a pint bottle of whiskey. He goes back the next day and gets a quart bottle of whiskey, a pound of bacon and half a dozen eggs. Um, so the contemporary newspaper report, this is a transcript from one of them, um, which says it was stated that the prisoner had been addressing envelopes and was starving when he committed the crimes. The sheriff said whiskey was a peculiar food <laughs> for a starving man. Okay, so that's Mr. Gray. Now the next three, a cheeky trio here from 1894. Um, I used this again in a, in a school workshop that I did and the children were, were really interested to see, obviously, that they, that they were children. They're pickpockets um, and they were uh, charged with theft. Um, they had picked a number of pockets um, at the Bathgate Hiring Fair in 1894. Um, one of the witnesses, Christina Watt, said she visited the flower stall in Engine Street. There was no other person at the stall but the accused Black came forward and spoke to her. The witness sympathised with him with his injured arm. She purchased a flower and just at that moment the boy disappeared. When she put her hand into her pocket, her purse was away. Now this is a transcript here from one of the charge books within Edinburgh City Police Collection. Um, and I think if we look at the ages that are recorded, uh, John Black, 16 years, John Wilson, 17 years and John Henry, 16 um, they don't really look a day over 10 years old to me. So whether that's the boys or the police um, recording uh, the wrong ages there, I don't know. But they were each sentenced to a month's imprisonment. The mothers of the accused were in the court and explained the boys had left home and had not been heard of until they were arrested. 
They'd given false names to the police and said they belonged to Dundee. Okay. <coughs> and then I just have three um, more images just to show you because they're quite interesting. Got the original James Bond here from 1903. Um, he's age 20, he's a joiner, five foot seven and a half. Um, the description um, of him in the book says he's a large scar right side of the head and back of the head. He's got thick lips and a nose thick at the point. And he was accused of theft. Um, and then George Washington here from 1907 is interesting. He's the only African-American within the volumes. Along with two others, he broke into a house in Gala Shields and stole a silver watch, two gold rings and a gold brooch and a silver thimble. His description says he's 24 years of age, five foot five, born in Pittsburgh, and his occupation is a sailor or showman. And this final picture here at the end um, is John Regan, 1875. The Edinburgh Evening News describes him as a rough looking fellow. Um, <laughs> I really like this photo, um, mainly because it, it shows two police officers just going about their business there, and he looks like he's really contemplating his fate uh, on the chair in the middle there. Um, he was tried at the High Court uh, for theft of a large quantity of cloth from a draper in Kirkintilloch and a large quantity of made-up clothing from a general merchant in Broxburn. Um, he was sentenced to seven years imprisonment. So that is the end of my talk, actually. That's just a really quick overview of some of the highlights that are in the collection. It's a great collection, and there's so much more um, that I could have shown you today, but unfortunately, it's just not, just not the time. Admission is free to the Rogues Gallery exhibition at General Register House, Edinburgh until 1st of December 2017. The exhibition features more material from the collections of the National Records of Scotland and Edinburgh City Archives, including police and court records of petty criminals, thieves, embezzlers and papers from the trial of the infamous poisoner Eugene Chantrell. This video is copyright of National Records of Scotland, all rights reserved.